this is a meeting of the lawyers group of Classics for All. It's one of the events which we put on as a thank you to members of the lawyers group uh, for their generous subscriptions. Because this meeting is online, uh, we have also invited anyone else who is interested to purchase tickets and come along. So I welcome all those outside the lawyers group who are here tonight. Uh, I thank you for uh, contributing financially to the work for Classics for All, uh, and I warmly welcome you for join to joining us. Tonight's speaker, Michael Scott, is a trustee of Classics for All. Mercifully, his camera still seems to work, uh, although mine, for some reason, has uh, given up the ghost. Michael uh, is, is um, uh, as I say, a professor of, of classics and ancient history at Warwick. He's a director of, of the Warwick Classics Network, of which you will hear more. Uh, he is also a founder of that network. Uh, on top of all that, Michael is a regular contributor to uh, television programs about the ancient world. He's passionate about communicating the ancient world to the uh, wider public. He's an honorary citizen of Delphi. He's won a prestigious award for raising the profile of classics. He has many other achievements which are included uh, in my uh, briefing note, uh, which I will not go through. Uh, I've been brushing up my Greek history earlier this evening and can assure you that the topic he has selected is a fascinating one. There will be a Q&A, a question and answer session at the end of Michael's talk. Please put any questions into the uh, Q&A box. I would just mention that I've received a message saying that the host has um, barred me from using my camera, but maybe that will be put right before the question and answer session. Right, uh, so after those slight technical uh, mishaps, uh, Michael, thank you very much for coming. Over to you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Rupert. And the, the idea of the host barring you from using your camera has some kind of bearing, I think, on what we're <laughs> going to be talking to tonight as to what the community will allow you to do and not to do um, as people try to move forward after a difficult period of civil warfare and turbulence, although I'm very glad to say that has not been the case amongst the Classics for All community this evening. <laughs> I also have to say to you uh, very sadly that the background you see is indeed a Zoom uh, uh, virtual background from a photo I took once when I had the joy of being able to be in Greece. I haven't managed to slip out um, to Greece uh, uh, and thus ignoring, of course, the amber warning uh, list uh, that is, of course, dominating all our lives at the moment. But hopefully we can throw ourselves back into a place far, far away and a time far, far away. And I wanted to talk with you this evening about a, a period, a very short moment in Athenian history, uh, which has always fascinated me ever since I really came across it um, when I started lecturing at Cambridge uh, when I was a research fellow there. And it always surprised me that it hadn't been more generally within uh, Greek history more of a popular moment to study because I think it shows Athens at both its most vulnerable and at its most innovative. Um, and so hopefully as we explore that moment this evening over the next 35 minutes or so, uh, you will uh, appreciate why uh, the long-term fascination uh, for me and uh, also kind of why this period of uh, Athenian history deserves a wider um, understanding and acknowledgement and interest. So I'm gonna try and uh, 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 placate the Zoom gods once more and share a PowerPoint with you. Um, so hopefully that uh, will come across uh, fairly smoothly. Um, do let us know in the chat or uh, uh, through the um, Q&A system if there are any problems. Um, the title this evening is Remembering and Forgetting the Past, Athens in 403 BCE. And I want to just take a moment to just situate ourselves as to what has happened just before this period. And I realize that for many of you, this may be quite familiar uh, territory, um, but just so that we've properly set the scene. So uh, what we're looking at um, is very much in the sort of year 405 to 404, uh, the end game of the Peloponnesian War. Um, now, many of you will be familiar with what the uh, end of the Peloponnesian War looked like, and we hear about this through the literary sources, particularly Xenophon, uh, who took up the great writing of the story of the Peloponnesian War after Thucydides, after his narrative ends in 411 BCE, and Xenophon's continues all the way through his Hellenica through to 362 and the Battle of Mantinea. 
What we hear about from Xenophon is the rather humiliating peace terms that Athens was forced to agree to um, at the end uh, uh, of the Peloponnesian War when the Spartan general Lysander um, effectively had starved the city into submission. The defensive walls of the city of Athens that had stood resolute and proudly defended the city both around the central city of Athens as you can see here in uh, the watercolour reconstruction but also of course the long walls that then connected the city of Athens down to its port, the Piraeus, all of these had to be torn down. Athens's fleet, which had for the best part of the last half century reigned supreme across the Aegean, had to be uh, disbanded, leaving them with only a paltry 12 triremes for self-defense. Athens had to become a friend and ally of Sparta, effectively thus in terms of its foreign policy to lead, uh, follow wherever Sparta then led. And Athens had to return, accept the return of its exiles, those that had expelled different points during the Peloponnesian War, who were mostly oligarchic sympathizers who had uh, been in sympathy with uh, others, uh, other city-states around Greece and with Athens's great adversary, Sparta and its Peloponnesian League, principally because they did not like the democratic uh, political system within Athens. Now, um, that was humiliating enough, but what we hear about both from Xenophon's Hellenica, but also from the later writer Aristotle in his constitution of the Athenians, the so-called Afpol, is that what happened uh, next was perhaps even more uh, extraordinary. Uh, as Aristotle puts it, the peace having been concluded on terms of their carrying on the government according to the ancestral constitution, i.e. Athens had to accept all of the terms we've just looked at, but it could maintain itself as a democracy. The popular party, the Democratic Party, endeavoured to preserve the democracy, but the notables who belonged to the Hetaeria, the Greek for sort of the comrades, the elite aristocratic group um, that uh, kind of would, uh, kind of, uh, the, the, of most of which were oligarchic sympathisers, and those exiles who had returned after the peace, mostly oligarchic uh, sympathisers, were eager for oligarchy. And then when Lysander, the Spartan general, sided with the oligarchic party, the people were cowed and forced to vote for the oligarchy. So we have an extraordinary situation here in 404 that the democracy of Athens actually votes itself with uh, pressure out of existence to be replaced by an oligarchy. And what form did that oligarchy take? It took famously uh, the form of 30 men who will later become known as the 30 tyrants, but at the beginning of their term of office, known as simply the 30. And these 30, according to Xenophon and Hellenica, had been chosen as soon as the long walls and the walls around the Piraeus had been demolished. And although chosen, however, for the purpose of framing a constitution under which to conduct the government, they continually delayed framing and publishing their, this constitution, but they appointed a council and other magistrates as they saw fit. So what seems to have happened is that the uh, oligarchic sympathizers force a vote and under pressure, the democracy votes itself out of existence, giving power over to a group of 30 who were only themselves supposed to be a sort of holding group uh, to write and frame a constitution, an oligarchic constitution for the long-term government of Athens, but who then effectively put off doing that and usurp power for themselves. And very, very quickly, uh, these 30 turn into what are known as the 30 tyrants. Um, as again, we hear from Xenophon and Aristotle who guide us through this very complex period of very fast moving period of Athenian politics. The 30, thinking now that they could play the tyrant without fear, issued a proclamation forbidding those uh, who were outside the role of 3000 full citizens that they of course created to enter the city and evicted them from their estates in order that they themselves and their friends might have these people's lands. To give you a sense of how much that is reducing the citizenship body, we think that the male citizen population of Athens towards the end of the Peloponnesian War was somewhere in the region of 20 to 25,000. So to reduce it to just 3,000 means an awful lot of people were suddenly disenfranchised. And when they fled to Piraeus, those who were disenfranchised, they drove many of them away from there also and filled both Megara and Thebes with refugees. They were chased out of the entire land of Attica. 
And as Aristotle goes on to say, but when they got a firmer hold on the state, they kept their hands, this is the 30, they kept their hands off none of the citizens, but put to death those of outstanding wealth or birth or reputation, intending to put that source of danger out of the way, and also desiring to plunder their estates. And by the end of a brief interval of time, they had made away with not less than 1,500. These 30 who had been voted power soon turned 30 tyrants who rule Athens uh, uh, in a, an extraordinarily brusque, vicious way. And it's not really a surprise that in less than a year by 403 BC, we see a democratic resurgence. And it seems to have happened uh, like this. An exiled democratic sympathizer by the name of Thrasybulus first leads a small group of exiles back from Thebes, back into the territory of Attica, winning a victory. And you can see here where Philae is, um, if we pointed out just here between Thebes up on the top left of this map, Athens down below in the bottom right, Philae very much on the borders uh, of Attica. This is where they first launched themselves back into Attican territory to begin the fight back for democracy. Gathering the supporters, they then make their way straight past the actual city of Athens to the Piraeus, which has always been a, a kind of a democratic hotspot and a more central focus of democratic support within the Athenian landscape, where eventually they will defeat the 30 tyrants in battle. An interim government of a 10 are then appointed by those 3000 still citizens who turn around and call for Spartan aid to defeat the democratic forces in the Piraeus. Sparta rolls back into Athens with its troops um, to uphold the rule of the Ten, and Spartans who are actually killed in this process are then buried in the Athenian burial grounds of the Karamaikos. If you're not confused by now, I'm sure many of the Athenians were at the time, because then the, uh, a renewed Spartan force turns up, this time led by a different general, the Spartan king Pausanias, who instead of upholding the rule of the Ten, actually decides to mediate a new peace and work with Thrasybulus to re-establish Athenian democracy. So in very, very short order, we've gone from democracy voting itself out of existence to uh, the emergence of 30 tyrants, to a democratic resurgence, to open battle in the Piraeus, to the expulsion and defeat of those 30, the appointment of another 10, Sparta rolling in to support the 10, battles in support of the 10, then Sparta rolling back in again to re-establish the democracy. The question then for Athens in 403 was, and this is where, as I think, Athens shows itself at its most vulnerable and most innovative, is how to bring this city back together uh, as a democratic uh, as a polis city-state, utilizing kind of the people that are available to the city. That means both oligarchic sympathizers, both those who have been uh, fighting against the Democrats, as well as the de those democratic supporters who have been fighting for the reestablishment of democracy. And to do all of that, when Athens itself is in an absolutely pitiful state, following not only uh, the end of the Peloponnesian War and it having to pull down its walls, lose its fleet, um, but simply the long uh, toll of the Peloponnesian War before that, having drained it of much of its resources and glamour. So what uh, did they choose to do? Now Xenophon Hellenica tells us um, that uh, the first step was perhaps the most innovative and unexpected. The Athenians chose to collectively forget the past. And this is how Xenophon puts it. They effected a reconciliation on these terms that the two parties should be at peace with one another and that every man should depart to his home except the members of the 30 and the 11 and of the 10 who had ruled in Piraeus. They also decided that if any in the, of the men in the city were afraid, they should settle at Eleusis. Effectively, everyone except the members of the 30 and the members of the 10, don't worry too much about the 11, um, were given an amnesty and that everyone was allowed to simply return to their homes. And if people who were living in the city, so the main central area of Athens, were too afraid that they were going to uh, find themselves um, at uh, the, the, the wrong end of retribution, mostly oligarchic sympathizers, they were allowed to go and settle at Eleusis, which was right on the borders of the territory of Attica and along 
long-term uh, oligarchic stronghold. They would definitely be safe there. Then Thrasybulus, the democratic uh, insurgent leader, had said this and more to the same effect, and he told them that there was no need of their being disturbed, but they had only to live under the laws that had previously been in force, i.e. before the 30 had been put in power, he dismissed the assembly. And they all pledged as they were under oath, so this was a religious oath to the gods that the collective Athenian community took, that in very truth they would not remember past grievances. The two parties, even to this day, live together as fellow citizens and the commons abide by their oaths. Now, this is quite an extraordinary idea, not simply to collectively forget the past, but as a result to go forward as one unit, not remembering the fact that they had quite literally very recently been at each other's throats. Now, we might imagine this actually uh, rather lofty ideal of simply forgetting the past and moving forward together as one, sanctified through the taking of a communal religious oath, may well in practice have broken down fairly quickly. But there are some indications that actually it uh, worked quite well. Others, as we'll come to see, uh, that uh, are in reality under the surface, those tensions continued to exist. So what happens after they've dismissed from the assembly and agreed this oath together? Well, in some ways, they carried on the business of erasing on the one hand and equally re-remembering the past on the other. The first thing they chose to do alongside collectively forgetting what had just happened over the last year, year and a half or so, was to get rid of anything that 30 tyrants had put in place that was still visible and might have some power and influence within the city. So a committee was set up to find all the laws that the 30 tyrants had got rid of, uh, and certainly those laws that they brought in, which were done away with, uh, and to reinscribe all the laws of the city of Athens um, within the royal stoa, within the agora, the central marketplace of the city, effectively offering a publicly available consultable list of the laws as they had been back in 405 to 4 BCE, as if the last year and a half had simply not happened. But then there were certain markers that could not simply be eradicated or got rid of. If you remember, I mentioned that there were some Spartans who died fighting on behalf of the 10 uh, against the Democrats in the city of Athens. And those Spartans were actually buried in the Athenian uh, graveyard, the Karamikos. Now that grave is still visible today and it has a nice inscription by it um, and we've in fact investigated the skeletons of those inside it and can show that, show that there were Spartan warriors laid out with some ceremony. Now you can't simply get rid of a grave within the Karamikos of ancient Athens and so you're left with this monumental marker on the landscape to a moment when Spartans were fighting with Athenian oligarchs against Athenian Democrats. What do you do with that kind of permanent marker of civil war? Well, what the Athenians seem to have done very swiftly is re-remember the story of what that monument actually was to. This is how Lysias will later put it in 392 BC, so about a decade later, in his Epitaphios to the dead in the Corinthian War. Uh, the Athenians find themselves back at war very quickly in the early fourth century. Uh, and the Epitaphios was a way of uh, uh, effectively giving a collective eulogy to those who had died fighting on behalf of Athens. Lysias was by this stage a famous orator in the law courts as well as within the public sphere. And Lysias turns to look at uh, and thinks about and points to, given this Epitaphios is actually delivered in the Karamikos, in the graveyard space itself. He's turning to and pointing to this tomb of the Spartans and simply says this. Nevertheless, having felt no fear for the multitude of their opponents and having exposed their own persons to the peril, they set up a trophy over their enemies, which now finds witness to their valor close to this monument in the tomb of the Lacedaemonians. There is no mention here in Lysias's account that the Spartans who were died and were buried in Athens were fighting on behalf of at least some Athenians. Here Lysias has re-remembered this tomb and this moment to have been a simple story 
of Athenians fighting against Spartans. It's us versus them, rather than some of us versus some of us and them. So you can see here, alongside that collective oath to forget the past, there were significant physical efforts to eradicate uh, the uh, landscape as it had been changed over the last year and a half, particularly in terms of uh, laws, um, but equally uh, attempts to retell the story of monuments that couldn't simply be eradicated. But there were also new monuments put up that did in fact remember communally moments of the democratic resurgence. And I think it's very interesting to see who these monuments focus on, because they don't focus on the Athenian citizen body themselves. They focus on those outside of the Athenian community who came to help the democratic insurgents re-establish the democracy and who, as a result, were welcomed in to become Athenian citizens and valued members of the community. What you're looking at is an inscription, IG2 uh, squared 10, or also available in Rhodes and Osborne, 2003, number four, dating to about 401 BCE, that was set up on the Acropolis, a huge uh, communal monumental stele um, that would have been very visible within the landscape at the heart of Athens's greatest shrine. And this is how it begins. So that worthy gratitude may be obtained by the foreigners who joined in returning from Philae, that first point where the democratic insurgents came over the territory from Thebes and Boeotia back, it, back into Attica, their first victory in the democratic resurgence. Be it decreed by the Athenians that there shall be citizenship for them and their descendants. This is an extraordinary offer from Athens. Rarely, very rarely, if at all before during the fifth century, had Athens so easily offered up citizenship, full citizenship, to outsiders. It will become something it does more regularly during the course of the fourth century, but actually by this stage, this is a really quite extraordinary offer. For those who came later, who joined in the fighting at Munichia and who remained in the Piraeus when the reconciliation was made, for them there shall be isotelea, i.e. they shall be taxed the same as citizens rather than taxed as resident foreigners, metics, which were who were taxed at a much higher rate. What's fascinating here is that those who showed more bravery joining in the democratic resurgence when things still looked very dicey as to whether the Democrats would win out, i.e. at Philae at the very beginning of the fight back, got the most honour, they got citizenship. Those who just came in later when things were looking more like the Democrats would win, or those who simply kept their heads down in the Piraeus, got a certain amount of honour, isotelea, but not quite the same as citizenship. And what follows is a long list of names uh, of people. And they're not just given their names, but also their, uh, their professions. Leptines, the butcher cook, Agesias, the gardener. It's a list of those kind of salt of the earth foreigners who joined in the great struggle to put democracy back in place in Athens um, and who were then celebrated for doing so. So we've seen communal forgetting, uh, eradicating uh, any kind of laws or activities that have uh, gone through, that have been put through by the 30 and re-establishing the laws as they were back in 405, re-remembering permanent monumental features on the landscape with different stories of them versus us, um, and here selective remembering and communal celebration of outsiders who have now become part of the Athenian community. But it's all looking so good so far, isn't it? And I think we need to give ourselves a bit of a reality check because the ancient sources do tell us about a number of times when it just manages to escape Athenian citizen lips that they might be remembering um, who was on which side in that period of time, 404 to 403. We hear from Lysias, the same orator who gave the Epitaphios in the Corinthian War in one of his law court speeches. He says this, but when they were close to the gates and grounded arms before entering the city, Asimus spotted Agoratus, who was a known informer for the Thirty, and went up to him, seized his shield and flung it away, telling him, go to hell. There's no place in the procession to Athena for a murderer like you. Or in Xenophon's Hellenica, we hear about Fibron, who also asked from the Athenians for 300 cavalrymen. And the Athenians sent some of those who had served as cavalrymen in the time of the 30, thinking it would be a gain to the democracy 
if they should go abroad and die there. Or Lysias again, we hear, suppose, uh, in another of his law court speeches, suppose that he were now under scrutiny for admission to the council, and he had his name registered on the tablets as having served in the cavalry under the 30, even without an accuser, you would reject him. So there seems to have been, despite the public affirmations of forgetting the past, an undercurrent of remembering, particularly uh, in individual cases, if the individuals have been closely associated with the 30, but more generally, if one is going to be trusted with any kind of public office, then association with the 30 in any way would uh, constitute a black mark. And more widely, certain sections of uh, the Athenian um, military machine, particularly the cavalry, seem to have had a long-term uh, kind of association with the 30, which makes them less trustworthy. But this is not um, the only thing that the Athenians are doing in these short years after 403 BCE. And I think this is where Athens not only again seeks to be incredibly innovative, but actually ends up setting their themselves and their democracy up to be incredibly strong. It's worth noting that 404 in the, uh, the period of the 30 tyrants was not the first revolution that Athens had had to deal with. In fact, it had had a revolution that had seen a temporary suspension of their democracy um, about a decade earlier in 411, 410. But actually, after the uh, resurgence of the democracy in 403, there is not then another period of time when democracy is put out of action right the way through until uh, after 322. BCE. So we're actually looking at the beginning of quite a long period of, despite a very rocky foreign policy world and a completely uh, extraordinarily rapidly changing Greek world, a period of quite extraordinary stability for Athenian democracy. And I think it's in the innovative um, moves that they make that we're going to have a look at now that Athens has really um, set themselves up to be able to achieve this. On the one hand, they move to reaffirm the democratic institutions um, uh, and organs of their city-state, and particularly that of the assembly, the ecclesia that meet on the Penix. Now, around 400 BC, we see the introduction of pay to attend the assembly. Now, the assembly was open to all male citizens, right? uh, and up to this point in time, it had only been those who were able to come to the Penex on a particular day who could take part in the debates. Now, you can imagine Attica is a wide territory. People who don't necessarily have the wealth to be able to just take a day uh, from their uh, fields, from their farms, the territory of Attica, uh, maybe at the borders of that territory where they would have to spend several days traveling backwards and forwards to be able to regularly attend the assembly and thus to actively participate in their democracy. But from 400 BC, there is the introduction of pay to compensate people for the time they spend actively participating in their political system. And that pay is rapidly accelerated so that it equates with the pay um, that had been in place for jury service since uh, approximately half a century before. The assembly is also empowered in that its business is no longer checked or decided in advance by the smaller council. Now anyone can raise any issue for discussion in the assembly and the number of its meetings per year is significantly increased. So on the one hand, this large grouping and gathering of the Athenian citizen, democratic citizen body is empowered and is uh, to do more, given more time to do more, and uh, a wider uh, selection of citizens are enabled or, uh, to be there um, by being compensated for their time. Yet at the same time, what Athens seems to do is spend quite a bit of effort to separate out the powers between decisions being made about the politics from the laws of their city-state. Now, we're very used to uh, the idea of separation of powers, um, but this was up to this point in Athenian history, not necessarily the norm. But going forward, the assembly was only allowed to pass uh, with uh, sphetisma, decrees. Um, any laws, known in Greek as nomoi, actually had to go before a board of nomothetai, lawgivers, as well as the assembly, if they were to have force. At the same time, the assembly had taken away from it its final jurisdiction, jurisdiction for conducting trials, which was uh, particularly to do with impeachment for treason trials, esangalia. So we're seeing a kind of uh, a separation of legal power and uh, political power um, going on at the same time 
as that political institution, the assembly, is significantly strengthened. At the same time, we also see the enhancement of the powers of the law courts in Athens. And we see this in three main ways. One is um, that uh, actually, uh, if we skip to jury courts handle dokimasi and euthanai, juries and jury courts are asked to handle the regular scrutiny of magistrates that happens before and after terms of office. So within the legal system of Athens going forward, actually all those holding public office actually end up being scrutinized. They have to answer to the juries, to the law courts at the beginning and end of their terms of office. Second way in which they seem to have strengthened the power of the law courts is by introducing something called graphe paranomon. Now, many of you may be familiar with ostracism, um, and this happened during the course of the fifth century in which the assembly could vote and decide uh, to ostracize, expel from Athens for a period of up to 10 years, an individual who was causing political trouble. Ostracism is not used by the end of the fifth century and into the fourth century at all, it disappears. And what instead replaces it is a legal process conducted through the courts called graphe paranomon, whereby you would go to court if you wanted to bring a case that an action in the assembly or somebody's action in the assembly was not according to the nomos, according to the laws of the city state. Therefore, effectively, the jury courts were given oversight over the business of the assembly and individuals within it. And finally, jury courts seem to have been strengthened um, by uh, an, increasingly an, an, uh, <laughs> an increasingly anonymous system of lot selection for the juries themselves. Now, juries in Athens were famously large, up to 1,000, 2,000 on occasion for particular kinds of trials. Most juries would often be in at least 500, 501. Now, the selection for this jury uh, had been uh, really done on a first come, first serve basis up to four or three. But after restoration, through over the next uh, several decades, there was the implementation of a fully uh, anonymized lot machine um, that chose the juries, the jurors who would serve on the jury service. And we actually have some surviving examples of these lot machines, so-called clerotarions. Now, the way these work um, is that every juror who was eligible um, to be selected for a jury had what was known as a pinakion, and you can see an example there, little uh, metal tag that had their name uh, and deem on it. And then they would go along to uh, the agora where there would be several uh, clerotarions. And you can see in this example here, you can see two of them um, side by side, each with five columns. Now, there were 10 tribes of Athens, so you can imagine the 10 long columns are each for a tribe, you would put uh, your pinakion into one of the slots uh, of the tribe to which you belonged. And then when all the pinakia were placed and all the slots were filled, um, there was a funnel that you can see there on the left hand side into which was uh, thrown a lot of black and white balls, a small crank at the bottom that was turned. And if a white ball came out, then uh, the overseers simply read across the first horizontal line of pinakia and chose those 10 people, i.e. one from each tribe, to be on the juries that day. If a black ball came out, then the next line uh, was not selected for jury service that day, and so on and so on, using black and white balls until um, they had all the jurors that they needed. This system allowed not only to have a large jury, which was difficult to bribe, but a completely anonymized jury that had been selected without really any chance of uh, that selection uh, being bribed or fixed in some way. Now, the law courts sound pretty impressive, don't they, by this stage? But even here, we have to uh, bring ourselves back uh, to reality a little bit, because, of course, many of you will be saying, hang on a sec, in 399 BCE, we know that Socrates was uh, tried in the law courts of Athens and indeed put to death, um, and his uh, trial has been called by many uh, a, a uh, example of mob rule in Athens, uh, the tyranny of the majority, um, Athens sinning against freedom of speech, and perhaps one of the blackest days in Athenian history. 
Um, now, many of you will be familiar with the case brought against Socrates and the ins and outs of his defense speeches as put forward uh, by Plato. Um, and also many of you may be familiar that uh, his court case, like so many before him that we've intimated, may well have had quite a lot to do with Socrates' association with one of the 30 Critias, and it being an example not so much of people being fed up with Socrates, uh, that gadfly of Athens, um, for uh, delivering constant put-downs and telling them they didn't know anything when they thought they did, but actually it being uh, a way of getting back at or uh, kind of taking uh, Socrates to court um, to exact some kind of vengeance for his association with the 30. Aeschines, uh, another orator of the period, puts it like this. Did you put to death Socrates the sophist, fellow citizens, because he was shown to have been the teacher of Critias, one of the 30 who put down the democracy? Now, of course, Athens turns out to regret its decision. Diogenes Laertius uh, lets us know that not long afterwards, the Athenians felt such remorse that they closed the exercise grounds in Gymnasia. They banished the other accusers of Socrates, put the main accuser, Miletus, to death, and they honoured Socrates with a bronze statue. So the law courts don't seem to get it all right, and there seems to have still been the ability to uh, at least uh, wreak uh, re re um, revenge and remember the past through the legal processes of the law courts. But uh, on the other hand, uh, what emerges in Athens from this period of intense innovation, both political, civic and legal innovation in the period after 403, is a very new and very stable Athenian democracy. And this is how some of the later writers um, look back on it. Isocrates was a political a writer and pamphleteerist who actually spends an awful lot of time in his writings favoring monarchical uh, or at least oligarchical systems. Isocrates is a big fan, for instance, of Philip, King of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great. But he has this to say about the democracy of Athens post 403. If we compare our own government, which is criticized by everyone, not with the old democracy, which I have described, but with the rule which was instituted by the 30, then there is no one who would not consider our present democracy the work of the gods. Aristotle puts it like this in his Constitution of the Athenians. 11th was the constitution established after the return from Philae and from Piraeus, from which date the constitution has continued down to its present form, constantly increasing the power of the masses. For the people has made itself master of everything and administers everything by decrees and by jury courts in which the people is the ruling power. For even the cases tried by the council have come to the people and they seem to act rightly in doing this for a few are more easily corrupted by gain and by influence than the many. We're making that point again, that this is for Aristotle, the final change of the Athenian constitution um, before it establishes itself uh, in a much more um, a positive frame. And so what I want to leave you with, and particularly thinking about the lawyers of you out there listening to this, is an image of Athenian democracy in the fourth century, in which the law and the power of the law, and particularly uh, the power of the law courts and of the juries, has really brought to Athens a stability that it has practically never known in its previous democratic history. Demosthenes, the great orator of the later part of the fourth century, will say this, the laws which rulers have made these jurymen rulers of all. Or as he goes on to say, for I see men of Athens, that the decisions of your courts have more authority, not only than those of the Halimusians who have expelled me, but more even than those of the council and the assembly. And justly so, for in all respects, the verdicts of your courts are most just underlining here that it's not just the law courts that have the most power of any organs of the state, but actually that the verdicts on the whole that come out of those courts are considered just. And as Lycurgus, who is, if you like, the last great uh, kind of leader within Athens before it gets subsumed under the wave of Macedonian uh, power, says this, for the things which uphold our democracy and preserve the city's prosperity are three in number. First, the system of law, second, the vote of the jury, and third, the method of prosecution by which the crimes are handed over to them. The law exists to lay down what must not be done, the accuser to report those liable to penalties under the law, and the juryman to punish all whom these two agencies have brought to his attention. 
And so what I would like to leave you with is an image of actually fourth century Athens that is really the example of stable, working democracy from the ancient world that actually we have the most in common with perhaps today and which we would want to look to in terms of inspiring our own current uh, systems and indeed thinking forward into our futures. Now, fourth century Athens and the fourth century more generally often gets a very bad press given uh, it's com uh, in comparison to the golden age of the fifth century BC, the time of the creation of the Parthenon of the great Athenian empire. The fourth century is in fact often known as the sort of poor cousin, the poor relation of the glorious fifth century. But if there's one thing I'd like you to take away from uh, this evening, it's that actually it's fourth century Athens that gets it right in the end. Thank you very much indeed. Michael, thank you for a truly brilliant presentation. Um, uh, I'm sure uh, everybody has learned a huge amount. Certainly I have, um, despite having studied classics many years ago. One footnote, if I may, to, to what you said, the uh, rehabilitation of Socrates was finally uh, completed six years ago when Classics for All held a retrial of Socrates before the Supreme Court. You will be pleased to hear that uh, on this occasion, the great philosopher was acquitted by a, a substantial majority. We now come to the uh, question and answer session. Um, to begin with, uh, there were no questions at all. Everyone was so stunned by the brilliance of your presentation. But finally, our, our learned audience uh, recovered. The first question is from Anthony Bainbridge. <clears throat> How is it possible that the men of Athens, weakened by the plague, famine, 30 years of war, the Sicilian disaster, and the interlude of the 30, yet managed to win at Piraeus in 403. It seems that the Athenians fought best when facing huge odds. <coughs> what would you say to that? Thank you very much both to you, Rupert, and to Anthony for the question. Yes, I mean, it, you know, it is an extraordinarily fast moving story of what goes on in Athens itself in this period uh, with the democratic insurgents, buoyed, of course, by those foreigners helping them from outside Athens who will go on to be given uh, full citizenship or if they turned up later, <laughs> Um, even even tax breaks uh, or even tax rates rather with Athenian citizens. Um, so it's not just those those same Athenians, if you like, coming back. It is an increase in enlarged force. Um, but uh, it comes back to kind of if we think back to Herodotus and what Herodotus would say uh, when Athenian democracy first comes into being back in 508. It is directly after that um, in 506 that Athens wins its first great uh, foreign military victory against against the Boeotians and Chalcidians. And Herodotus puts it like this, that the, the, the men are fighting better and harder when they're fighting on behalf of their own individual freedom uh, than when fighting for um, others. So I think there was a sense, uh, and I think we have to kind of bring that back into play again here, um, that uh, these uh, people are fighting quite literally um, for uh, their lives, but also for uh, their long uh, enjoyed freedoms that they want back, buoyed by some new forces um, to help them along the way. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Lawrence Kenham. You said that the restoration of democracy, <coughs> sorry, you said that after the restoration of democracy, the laws were inscribed to be made publicly available. Had this been done in Athens before? Mm. Interestingly, we don't think in such an explicit and full form. Um, this is kind of one of those moments where quite simply they do seem to have taken stock and wanted to make it very clear where uh, they stood, where the people stood, what laws were they actually facing, particularly when they've been through such a quick period of change. If you think first the 30 uh, changing or chucking out laws, bringing in new ones, then that board of 10 changing the laws again. So I think there was a huge amount of confusion and that they their response to this was to create a um, kind of very permanent 
public uh, board that could be uh, consulted. There had been, of course, during the fifth century previously, a kind of records house um, in the heart of Athens in the Agora, where records of decisions and decrees and laws had been kept. But this wasn't as easily consultable, and it certainly wasn't as public and as monumental a form as this new kind of uh, publicly inscribed document set of the laws that were set up. So I think they're, they're really going to a whole new level um, in terms of the, uh, the publicly uh, visible nature um, of the uh, of kind of this is where we stand. These are the laws now. That's very interesting. And of course, the accessibility of, of the law is a topic in which certainly all members of the lawyers group have a considerable interest. Our next question is from Tim Holroyd. Re Pausanias's decision in 403 BCE, he's very correct, 403 BCE to permit, encourage the re-establishment of democracy, what had been his position a year or two earlier? Um, yes, I mean, I think this very much is, again, it's quite a complicated story, and it has more to do, I think, with the uh, tussle for power and influence within the Spartan system, um, and particularly Pausanias facing off against Lysander, uh, the Athenian uh, the Spartan general who had been mainly responsible for kind of winning the Peloponnesian War. Um, and uh, the kind of, this is a moment when Pausanias has a chance to reverse uh, Lysander's uh, decision making, which he's quite want to do. He then actually has to go back and uh, face quite a bit of um, upset about this from the Spartan ephors and from the Gerousia. Um, in fact, there seems to have been a trial from which he's acquitted. And this kind of rivalry between Pausanias and Lysander actually bumps along for at least the next, uh, sort of just under the next decade or so. So um, I think it's it's more to do with, with uh, Spartan kind of internal politics, if you like, necessarily, but from which Athens, uh, of course, benefited. Thank you very much. Now we have a question from Robin Hughes. What would you recommend as the best academic study on the subject of the 30 oligarchs and this period? I, I mean, Robin, it's an excellent question. And uh, when I was talking at the beginning about first coming to this period when I was uh, teaching it, one of the things that uh, I did was do a sort of bibliometrics graph and look at sort of histories of Athens and of Greek history more generally of the classical period. So the classical period running from 480 BC post-Persian invasions to 323 and the death of Alexander. And what you'll see across all of those books, nearly all of them, is that uh, they give a much greater weight of pages to talking about the fifth century than they do to talking about the fourth century. It's that fourth century as the poor step cousin um, idea that has long and far too long held sway. As a result, there are not uh, that many uh, kind of really good books that focus on uh, this period. And actually the first book I ever wrote was an attempt to try and open up the fourth century to uh, readers who had had no previous experience of, of, of Greek history. Um, but I would particularly recommend now, um, things have started to turn around and particularly there's a good number of edited volumes that seek to take the fourth century as their collective focus, but then look at uh, particular aspects and places uh, within the Greek world during the fourth century, both from a political viewpoint, but also thinking from a cultural viewpoint. Um, editors like uh, Trittle, um, but also uh, thinking about um, kind of uh, thinking if you want to think particularly about Athens, um, then uh, kind of I can send you a list of a couple uh, after this if you get in touch with me by email. <laughs> a reading list to come. I mean, Simon Hornblower's uh, History of the Greek World has quite a lot about the fourth century. I don't know if you, I, I mean, I find it quite a helpful book. I don't know if you would commend it or not. Yes, absolutely. That and also Peter Rhodes kind of is the other kind of scholar who, who bibliometric wise has more pages dedicated to the fourth century uh, than uh, to the fifth century. So kind of there's a, a good couple of examples to start people off. Yes. Then an anonymous attendee asks, uh, says, do we know what happened to the Areopagus, Areopagus during this period? Uh, it's really interesting, isn't it? The Areopagus as the sort of central home to the older ar aristocratic leaning oligarchic sympathizing council, um, who we know are a real thorn in the democracy's side. So while I painted this picture of Athenian democracy being stable from this point onwards through down to 322, it's not that they don't have their concerns at times that the democracy is going to be overthrown. And in fact, one of the most famous pieces of um, legislation to survive from the fourth century in Athens is the law against tyranny that's passed at a particular moment when uh, the, the, the Athenians are very concerned um, 
that democracy is going to be overthrown again. And the law simply states that if anyone goes up to the Areopagus and does any kind of formal business after democracy has been usurped, um, they're going to lose everything, their citizenship, their land, their estates, their monies, everything, and they'll be chucked out on their ear. And a copy of that law is very specifically set up just outside the entrance to the Areopagus. So you can get a sense of the flavor and feeling with which the Areopagus was um, received within the Athenian sort of democratic landscape. Um, in terms of what actually the Areopagus does during this particular period, 404 to 3, and then onwards, it doesn't seem to appear or be named deliberately in any of the sources we have as a, a place that needs to be watched. So we don't know, kind of in that sense, what, if any kind of particular role it played. One imagines that it was involved in um, the meetings, the roll call of the 30, the 3000, the 10, etc., cetera, um, but, but nothing absolutely specific. Thank you. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on the time. We have three minutes left for the Q&A session. So I'll slip in one more question from Thomas Dumont. Can we trust Demosthenes or was he flattering the jury? Well, uh, Something I have to all lawyers attempted to do, if I may <laughs> say. Uh, well, I was going to say, Rupert, you should know more about this. I mean, in this particular case, I would never trust Demosthenes. Um, uh, except for, uh, you know, the one thing I think you can trust Demosthenes on, that he, he at least um, doesn't change his kind of uh, tune that much regarding the Macedonians. He at least sticks to one tune there, which is that they're a bad thing, um, despite the fact that uh, kind of when it comes down to it, uh, and eventually the Athenians face up against the Macedonians and Philip of Macedon, the battlefield of Chironea, um, Demosthenes, we're told potentially in the sources, ran off and left them to it. So I'll leave you to make your own mind up about Demosthenes. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. Uh, as I say, a, a truly fantastic lecture and scintillating answers to questions from our audience. Um, <coughs> before we proceed to show a film about the uh, Warwick Classics Network, uh, since I'm about to vanish from the screen and about time too, you may say, uh, may I thank all of you for coming, both members of the lawyers group uh, to whom we are indebted, uh, and all those outsiders who we are very happy to welcome to our meetings and hope you will continue to come uh, in the future. Uh, can I remind you all that anyone with an affiliation to the legal world is most welcome to join the uh, lawyers group of, of Classics for All. For a modest subscription of £150 per year, you're supporting the work of, of, of Classics for All and you also get free entry to fascinating events such as we have seen this evening. Uh, I'd add, of course, that if Classics, that Classics for All does uh, invaluable work in schools, as you all know and have seen from previous films, and we'll see again in a couple of moments when I shut up. Uh, but I I if you've enjoyed this talk and wish to show your gratitude uh, and to further support the, classic, the work of Classics for All, uh, you are uh, most welcome to make a donation. Details are on the Classics for All uh, website. We're now going to end with a short uh, video about the Warwick Classics uh, Network, founded uh, and run by uh, Michael Scott, our speaker. Uh, Michael founded this in 2018, so it's now some three years old. The Warwick's Classics Network is one of 17 uh, regional networks which are supported by Classics for All across the country. They enable us to work locally with primary and secondary schools interested in teaching classics. <coughs> the video you're about to see highlights the Warwick Classics Network's Ancient World Study Day, which was held at Warwick University in 2019. The study day saw almost 1,000 school children and members of the public welcome to the university to hear talks by uh, classical, uh, by uh, eminent classical scholars uh, uh, and to take part in workshops led by academics from the Warwick Classics Department. But that's not all. The Ancient World Study Day returns for 2021. It will be online next week on the 16th of June and it will look at topics from the ancient history, history and classical civilization curricula with the theme of expanding uh, horizons. Any West Midlands based pupils in the webinar audience are particularly encouraged to uh, sign up uh, and you can get details about uh, these, that event 
I think again from the Classics for All website, or alternatively, I'm sure uh, if you contact Michael. So uh, thank you all very much. Uh, I will now mute myself um, uh, and we will watch the video about the Classics, uh, Warwick Classics Network. Today I've been attending a World's Classic Day at Warwick University. We came with our Latin department to widen our knowledge on the classical world. It's just a place for professors to share their passion with students. We started off this morning kind of with the younger age group and we were talking about storytelling. And what was fascinating there was seeing the overlap between ancient storytelling and how those same narrative arcs are still used today in major Hollywood productions, right? The way we tell a story hasn't really changed that much in 2000 years. And then in the afternoon, we moved to kind of thinking with GCSE and A-level students more uh, systematically about what kind of stories the ancients told themselves um, and how did they do that. Important mixed trivia nine and 10 students. So we've got kind of like between 13 and 15. And I actually think the talks were a really good level for them. It wasn't too difficult, but it was also quite challenging and quite inspiring. They've all been really engaging and they've covered a really broad aspect of classical civilization as a subject, which I think is really good. The most interesting thing is that they, whatever they heard in class, they, they heard it now as well from the actual speakers that they have written those books that they have studied. I think it's always good to show students that this is what university life is like and that these subjects are studied in real great detail and that actually the enjoyment of learning goes like far beyond school years. I've always considered doing classics in the future this just makes me want to do it even more because it's so interesting and it gives you an idea of what it would be like studying it at university like with the lectures and the different style of teaching. So from attending events like this what I hope students take home is that you are part of a much much bigger family of people who love thinking about and engaging with the ancient world. The second take home is simply this the ancient world is not dead and buried it is very much alive we see it in every part of our lives as we look around us today and the values and ideas of the ancient world can also be really useful as we sit and think about what are going to be our priorities our actions as we go forward and for a young generation who are going to be ever more global <laughs> ever more concerned with the great problems that concern not just individual countries or nations but humanity and, and the world at large we need as much of the ancient world as possible to help inform them as they take on the challenges of tomorrow.